Yeah, so the, the title of, of my, as I was thinking about the audience and you all being across the university in different colleges, I wanted something that, that everyone could relate to. So the title of this is Implementing Action-Based Learning into the Classroom Environment to Drive Student Engagement and Learning. And to me, a few things that I have learned over the years, both professionally and through observation of students, is you learn most through doing. And by doing in a safe environment, we can really expedite that, that learning curve. So just uh, thank you for the, the introduction, Dr. Ashish. A, a little more about me, originally from Ohio. And in, in, as, as Dr. Ashish, Ashish said, I spent about seven years in Shell Oil. And I'll pull some of those experiences into our session today. But my goal is to give you all at least one nugget that you can take away and incorporate into to your classrooms. But I also want to take a, a nugget away from, from you all as well. So hopefully by the end of the session, everybody will be able to say that, that we've accomplished that. I'm going to share two books with you. The, definitely the Cliff Notes version that has kind of informed the way that I structure my classes and syllabus. And then I'm going to share a live example of something that I'm pretty proud about that we're doing here at the Fisher College of Business for thousands of students. So this is something that we've been able to, to scale. Okay, let's start with relationship rich education. So it's really not whether or not human connections drive success, it's how they drive success. So within our classrooms or the university setting, how do we create these networks or webs where there's free flow of information? So many times I catch myself and I see other colleagues as well thinking about the content that we're going to teach which ultimately creates the syllabus, right? But per, potentially an even more important question that we should be asking ourselves is what environment do we want to foster or create to facilitate human connection and learning? And it sounds like in your previous 10 sessions, you've been hearing a lot of that. And this is a difficult question to answer because it will be different from environment to environment or classroom to classroom, depending on the content and the subject matter. So in so many ways, it is a very difficult question to answer, but I can tell you human connection is the basis upon which learning takes place. And it's essential that we understand that there's no learning without relationships. It's, it's truly the beating heart of the college experience and it's what people are thirsting for. So we hear, I hear stories all the time from alumni who are one relationship away or one conversation away from dropping out. Or perhaps it's a story from an alumnus that is one relationship or one conversation closer to achieving that dream job. And we as faculty members can create that web of connections in a thoughtful way. And we'll talk about how to do that. The other book that really informs how I structure some of my content is by Chip and Dan Heath, their brothers, and it's called The Power of Moments. And I think this is, this is so powerful and I'll give you the, the five big, big ideas so you don't have to read the, the 200 page book if you haven't read it all already. But at a high level, when we recall an experience, we tend to remember the flagship moments. And those flagship moments tend to be either the peaks, the valleys or pits, or the transitions, the transition to college or the transition out of college. And a defining moment is generally a very short experience but it's, it's, it's memorable and meaningful. So how, how can we create these moments for our students? Generally speaking, they have to have at least one of these four categories. 
the first being elevation, being, being lifted out of the ordinary. The second and probably the most common in an academic setting is insight. These are moments that reshape the way in which we view the world. There are also moments of pride. That's a feeling of deep satisfaction, right? That, that's derived from an achievement. And then connection gets back to that, the, that relationship discussion where we feel associated with others or associated with a community in a very meaningful way. If we are able to create moments that have one or even more of these categories, learning is going to take place and students are going to remember it. Think about a wedding. I, I love Indian weddings as an example. They have all four of these, right? There is no doubt that there's elevation in terms of fine food and dancing and fancy clothes. There's insight from toasts and gestures and storytelling. There's pride in being happy to be a part of, of that group. And then there's also those moments of connection that you're sharing that specific moment with loved ones. So human nature, we are trained to fix the potholes. However, when we're thinking about a class maybe not going so well, instead of fixing the pothole, perhaps we need to try to create a peak moment. And I'll talk about how that translates to, to one of the courses that I teach. So at, at Fisher, I teach both on the graduate and, and undergraduate side, mostly HR classes. But one of my primary responsibilities is the college's introduction to business class. And Ohio State, just to give you a little bit of context, we enroll about 70,000 students a year and about 8,000 of those students are undergrads here in the business school. And as part of the core curriculum, every single student at Fisher takes my course. That's that introduction to, to business class. And as I made the transition from industry back into academia, and I was thinking about the content that would be associated with this course, one thing that, that kept coming back to me that I felt like I was kind of flying blind in industry was dealing with crises. And regardless if you're in, in business or not, so many times we're having to work through either a small or very big crises. And so many times we're figuring it out as we go, right? And these are very important moments because all eyes are on us and every single move that we make is going to be scrutinized. So one of the images I share with the students as I'm kicking off kind of this session on crisis management is, is this spotlight. And let me just open it up to, to all of you. When you see this, what type of emotions are evoked? How does it make you feel? Scared? <laughs> Excited? Somebody says ready Somebody for action. Ready for action. Ready for action. Hope. Good. Yeah. Center stage being watched. The yes. center stage and being watched, somebody says. And, and when I'll pull the classroom, I'll get emotions from being very fearful to super excited. They want to be front and center stage and everything in between, right? So with, with crisis management, what I, what I emphasize the most to students, again, is every single move that you make is going to be scrutinized and it will influence the next move. So just to tie this to industry before I get in the example is crises happens every day all, of around, all around us. And sometimes we bring this upon ourselves and other times, especially like with the pandemic, it's thrust upon us and we have to react. So you all have had to pivot to online learning just like us over here. 
I don't know where you are in the pandemic in terms of figuring out how to come back and what that looks like, but every decision, again, that we make, students are going to question, well, why this versus that? And when we look at these industry examples, we have so, seen so many leaders falter and even lose their job as a result. Now, why is this so? Because generally speaking, we are not trained in crisis management. So as part of this core introduction to business class, and we have about 1,200 students a semester, I wanted to create a peak moment, a moment that students would get to experience as a group, which would drive that connection to others, and it would be a safe environment where they get to learn by doing. So I'll talk about what that looks like. So teams participate in a week long experience. And during that experience, we're hitting on several core business concepts that regardless of their major, whether it be finance or HR or operations management, marketing, they are going to have to know. These are transferable skills. So teamwork and decision-making, effective communication and time management. Our semesters are about 16 weeks long, and this particular experience takes about two weeks to deliver. So it is a larger component of their grade, but just know there's several other things that, that we also cover in the class. And the way that this is set up is I have a lecture on crisis management and teaching framework a crisis management framework to the students that they can use and they read a case that I have written and the students are on teams of five to eight and they will assume executive roles for this made up company and I'll, I'll share one of the companies here in a second after they have determined roles so the CEO the chief financial officer chief HR officer marketing communications legal etc they will get thrust into this crisis. And we have been able to automate this case so we can scale it. So it started out with just 30 students, very high touch. And we said, we're not reaching enough students with this good experience at the, at the College of Business. How can we scale it to a thousand per semester? So it's not quite as high touch anymore. We've automated it through a central inbox, but it is dynamic in, in that once the case gets kicked off, they receive automated emails. And we ha I have a team of grad assistants that are responding to the team's responses in real time throughout the week. The case then culminates a week later where the student teams will report out to a board of directors. That board of directors is myself, people from industry that are here in Columbus, Ohio, so alumni and other graduate students as well. And that's not a typical presentation where you go in and just speak to an audience. We are peppering them with questions, challenging them on decisions that they've made throughout the week. And then really the, the real learning happens in the debrief where we are able to compare from team to team, why did this team shut down operations right away? Why did this team wait for two days? What are the pros and cons of that? And what were the consequences of that? So to give you a little more context before I open it up to, to Q&A, I've written four of these cases now, and the most recent is a company called Momentum. This company is headquartered here in Columbus, Ohio. It's written five years out into the future where there are semi-autonomous delivery trucks. And the students don't know this, but there's been a glitch in their IT system that's caused three accidents. So that is the initial crisis that they get communicated to. And then over the course of the following week, more crises get thrust upon them and they have to figure out how to respond to that. So what makes this, this particular case kind of a peak moment for the students is we have made it as real life as possible. So we've gotten local media involved and I'll show you a video here in a second. 
And when they're getting a news briefing, it's not your typical email. It's, it's an actual video of a news anchor here in town explaining what's going on and waiting for the executive team at Momentum to react. So let me position away from this and let me know if the streaming is, is coming through here. I want to share, so the initial email that the students get is from a safety manager at the company. Hey, we've got a problem. There's been an accident. 15 minutes later, they receive a link to this video. And I'm going to show it to you now just to give you a little more context for what it feels like for the students to be in this situation. I can drop the link in the chat box as well if it's not streaming through. It's coming through. Concern when it comes to self-driving vehicles. We've just received reports of three commercial truck accidents across the United States. The trucks that crashed were semi-autonomous. They were owned and operated by local logistics company Momentum, based right here in Edna, Ohio. So one accident took place in San Antonio, Texas, where the driver is said to be in critical condition. Another accident happened in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, with a school bus full of elementary school children. And finally, that third accident took place here in Columbus, Ohio. It involved a multiple car pileup. Ten TVs on the scene of this third crash and working to learn more about the condition of the people involved. Now, we have reached out to Momentum for a comment, but they have not yet responded. Here's what we know about the company, though. Momentum is a cargo shipping company which provides delivery services for many major retailers, including Amazon. It launched the first fleet of semi-autonomous delivery trucks early last year. And ever since, it has seen an increase in deliveries using those trucks. But the news of these two crashes comes at the heels of autonomous vehicles being questioned for their ability to be safe on the road. So we'll stay on top of the story for you as it develops. Tonight at 5, we'll look deeper into the debate surrounding driverless vehicles. Keep it here on 10 for the latest and 10TV.com for more background into Momentum and its driverless fleet. So you can imagine a group of five to eight undergraduate sophomores, business students, really hungry and thirsty to, to learn in a war room or a Zoom breakout room, depending on the, the environment, getting that news clip and additional information and having to scramble. So having to identify stakeholders, who are we going to communicate to and how do we assume responsibility when we don't have all of the information? What are we doing for the family members of the victims? What are we communicating to our own employees? Are we giving them time off? Do we shut down operations? What are all the implications of these literally hundreds of decisions that we need to make in just that first day? And throughout the next seven days, they're getting, again, these automated emails. And we had the, the local news team tier team here did about four of these videos for us. They were very gracious in doing that. And it does give the, the, the real gravity of the situation. It gives the feeling for, to the students that this is, this is kind of real. This is what it would be like in, in real life. So before I open it up for, for comments and questions, I've got one more video that just shows the whole experience for the, the, the students to give you the, the final bit of context. Fisher College of Business prioritizes leadership. In this case, it's all about putting students in a simulation where they had to go through a crisis situation. It was as real life as possible. And as a result, when they go out into their careers, hopefully they'll be better prepared to be the authentic leaders over the last three days, we took the students through an entire process where a factory in China was set on fire, employees perished, and the students had to react to it. There were three key deliverables in this case. One was them working together as a team to build their reaction to this tragedy. The second was they did have to field questions from the media through a press conference. 
press conference, held them accountable for what had happened, but also talked about the future of this company. And then finally, the case concluded with a meeting with the board of directors, where students had to get advice from the board, but also talk about what they had done to date. I think that the faculty of the I think was the greatest experience I've had um, so far this year, really getting a real sense of what it's like to not only work in the business and get reassigned emails, but also to handle a crisis and it's something that we've never done before. You're in this crisis situation where you have to stay fast and react to the public and to the media as fast as possible. And so doing that with your whole team contributing to your decisions is a very unique experience. This was something that captured all of the in-class learnings that we've had over the past three years and gave it a real world application. I hope at the conclusion of this case, the students are gonna look back on this as a transformational experience and one that really built their leadership and teamwork skills. We started this three years ago. And as I mentioned, we had to start small with 30 students and figure out how is this going to work. And because of the positive responses from it, the, the challenge from our Dean and Neil Makija was, Ty, we're not reaching enough students with the experience. How can you take this to every single student at Fisher? So we haven't been able to be quite as high touch as what you just saw in that video when you've got 12,000 students a semester, but I do have an army of graduate assistants that help make this unique for each individual recitation session. And the, the results have been outstanding. Our effic efficacy measurements we see a significant improvement. And the case has been around for a couple of years and we're cycling from case to case, from semester to semester because we know how much the students talk and share information. So we don't want them to know what's coming, but there is this excitement that is built up before they even start the case. They know it's going to be a ton of work over the course of a week, but because they know it's coming, they prepare for it. And when they're putting that amount of effort in and all of that connection is taking place, you, you're pretty confident that you are going to create a peak moment and one that they'll, they'll remember into their careers. And hopefully when they do face a real crisis, they'll be more prepared to respond. So I know a lot of the, the faculty members on this call are not in the, in the business school, but I hope some of the concepts that I shared can totally be incorporated into your classroom environment. But at this point, I just wanna pause and open it up for co comments, questions, reactions, maybe even sharing how you incorporate peak moments into your classroom environment. Uh, thanks. Tyler, I'll just uh, kind of uh, take it for, for your uh, whatever you've discussed so far. It's uh, easy to deal with the cases and in the management kind of a course. But there is a question which I was about to ask is, how do you deal with the students who come unprepared to the class? Because in India, we face this kind of a prop challenge a lot that the student would come and say that I'm not prepared with the uh, case. I've not read the case. How do you deal with this kind of a problem? Yes, that if somebody's got a great answer to that, please let me know. <laughs> now, one of the things that I, I think has been somewhat effective for this particular case is your, we, we emphasize that your teammates are relying on you. And once you learn about what happens, the crisis itself, you have to immediately start reacting and if you're if you haven't read the case and you are unprepared you're going to be immediately exposed now on the back end of this and i didn't really cover it but there is a peer-to-peer -peer evaluation that influences their overall grade so again if you're not prepared hopefully the students will hold you accountable for that but you're especially with a with an audience as large as 1200 a semester you're always going to have a, a segment of the population that's probably not read the case. Okay. Although you have, we have touched upon that one. There was a second question related to that only. So how do you assess the students in such a uh, exercise, which is maybe uh, stage-wise or going over two weeks? So how do you assess them? 
Yeah, so we we have a pretty detailed rubric that w so we assess the 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 week leading up to the meeting of the board of directors and then in the moment that presentation that they give and the responses to the questions is also assessed and one of the things that we do that I think is very very helpful for the students is we record that presentation and because it's also a business communications class so we always have the students go back and watch their video and I always tell them to watch it twice the first time without audio obviously when you're doing that you're evaluating your nonverbals, your hand gestures your eye contact your movement that kind of stuff and then the second time with audio you're looking at volume and pace and filler words so they get to self-assess as well that doesn't influence their grade but I think having that feedback loop to themselves because so many of our students are their, their hardest critics, right? And I'm sure you, you have plenty of those students as well. So giving them the opportunity to just watch it back and be like, oh my gosh, I should have done this instead of that can be a powerful learning moment. Uh, although this not being asked, but I have a question to that only. Uh, normally, when we talk about or look at the students evaluating the other students, their own uh, perceptions and biases come into play. So how do you control that? Yeah, so we don't have a, a formal control mechanism for that. On a team of eight, we take the average score of all of the peers. So we hope that, you know, if, if there's a one-off, you could throw that out and average the rest. But what we'll find, especially for the students that are ill-prepared, they get consistent poor marks. And when we see that, we know that they probably didn't show up or they were missing in action throughout the week when they were supposed to, to respond. So having a few more data points in those situations can help, but that, that's a challenge as well. It's a good point. Okay, uh, now uh, there is one more question, which uh, in the meantime, others can write down. There is one thing which, uh, what kind of cases do you think uh, for a management? Like I've seen uh, from my own experience that if we use cases which the students can relate to better, like about a football club or in, if you talk about in India, related to cricket or some uh, Bollywood, they respond to those kind of cases better as compared to a case which is written on a, uh, maybe a metals or a mines kind of industry. So how do you find out that what kind of cases should be focused on and what should be the ideal length of the case? Because if the case goes to 30 or 40 or pages, the student tend to skip it. But if the yes, case remains yes. to about seven to eight pages, they uh, have that tendency to go for it. You are spot on about that because they'll look at the, the thickness of the case and they make a decision right then and there. Am I going to read it or not? So my cases, the four that I have written are between six to 10 pages, not including attachments, which is completely manageable, right? And you are, you're exactly right that it has to be a topic that the students would find interesting. And a lot of the topics have been, have been solicited from students. So the semi-autonomous vehicles is definitely something that students are interested in. We have another case, uh, the company that, that I made up is called Propato and there's glass in the food product. And we see recalls all the time, right? So this is something that they can relate to and people are dying from, it's in baby food, it's in pizza, this and that, and people are dying as a result. So again, the executive team has to respond to that. I also have a, a sports case. We have not yet, the, the sports case is going to be used for this coming fall. So I, I do think if you're going to write a case, you should focus on an industry that appeals to the masses and doesn't seem so abstract that they can't relate to it. So Tyler, I'll suggest you one case which you will look for uh, crisis is the IPL when uh, CSK was banned because of the, uh, betting on the cricket i'm i'm writing that down <laughs> because that is something which indians or ipl is such a big one at times i use that kind of connection also because the betting became an issue it's banned in india 
and the, the two teams which were straight away banned. So how do the board responded to that one? So you can use that as a starting point. Yeah. It, it could be a better one. That's great. <laughs> And it, okay. for, for anybody on the line that you're like, this could, this could work in my specific class, send me a note. I am happy to send the case over to you. You can use it. You, yes, can, yes. you can tailor it to, to, to your needs. No problem. Yeah, yeah, well, definitely. Okay, I've got another question from a colleague, Dr. Raj Kumar Gupta. Uh, he asked, Indian higher education system is the third largest uh, education system in the world with close to about 1,000 universities and millions of the students. Uh, India is a country with diversity in culture. So apart from quantity, diversity is also a big challenge in the country. Uh, apart from managing quantity and diversity, other challenges in the higher education system are to ensure quality, equity, access, uniformity, and relevance. Can you throw some light how you manage diversity in your class because having 1,200 students not all of them will be from Native Americans. They will be somebody coming from maybe Brazil or South, somebody coming from India with different kind of backgrounds. So how do you manage them? They might bring a different kind of perspective to the problems based on their own experiences in the past. So how do you manage that kind of uh, cultural diversity over there? So that's a great point. And it, it is a constant challenge. I mean, one of the things that is a continual challenge at Ohio State is the international students will tend to stick together and the domestic students will tend to stick together and just think about the missed opportunity for learning exchange. So in, in this introduction to business class, class number two, we, we talk about diversity and inclusion and how everybody brings a different perspective and value one of the benefits that we have is I, I conduct the lecture and then there's a 40 person recitation that meets for an hour and 50 minutes each week. And that's when we can really bring that diversity to light and pull students in to bring their different perspectives. Now, when, when we, we recognize that students have different resources available to them and making sure that you acknowledge that, but also create an environment where they're comfortable coming to you and sharing that so that you're aware of it is, is critical. And I think having that diversity and inclusion session early on in the semester helps facilitate some of that conversation. The other thing that we do a lot of in this particular course is just team breakout sessions, and they are on the same team for the entirety of the semester. This particular case is towards the end of the semester. By the time that we get to that, they know everybody's first and last name. They know where they're from. They know their skill set to a certain extent. And that creates a, an environment of more accountability as well. So I, I'm kind of dancing around the question because it is a hard one to, to face. No, uh, I just want you to throw some light on the how you form the groups because normally what happens is if we form the groups after the students have joined the session, they tend to focus on becoming group members with their uh, close friends or like-minded people and the learning stops. So do you form the groups? Uh, how do you form the groups in that kind of 1200 students? Yeah, that's a great question. And I've, we've tried a lot of different ways. The, the where, where I'm at right now today, and I plan to do this next academic year as well, is we have every single student take an intake survey on day one. It's a simple Qualtrics measurement. It asks for the, their, their major, where they're from, career interests, industry interests. And based on that, we'll pair them up as diverse as possible. So male, female, international student versus domestic student. And then all of the different majors, we try to get a good mix on each team. I, I totally agree. There, there are some pros to allowing them to pick their own team, but I don't think the pros outweigh the cons in that environment. So we select the teams for them. Okay, so you selected. And I'm sure that there would be no request entertained afterwards to change the groups. That you <laughs> must not be doing. Because the students yes. tend to come in that in, in grading, grading, this is a team graded assignment and you'll absolutely have the students that check out, barely even participate during it. 
So these high touch experiences, they also create a lot of work for the faculty members and some headaches, pulling out your hair kind of situations. But again, that's such a small segment of the population. I try not to focus on that group. Okay. If you can pull them in, great. But if not, you've got to focus on your 80% that are engaged in our learning. Okay. Now, there is one more uh, in the group activity and the assessment also, which I want to raise because normally what happens, you might also be facing that uh, problem at times. Uh, all of them will not be native uh, communication in English. Like we also at, over here face the challenge that the students come from known English speaking background, their Hindi speaking belt and all those kind of things. So when you evaluate them on presentation, now there could be, let's say out of the group of 10 students two have made the presentation, but the entire group is assessed on the communication which is being done by those two students, which at times the faculty tries to randomly select. So how does the communication creates a barrier for other evaluation patterns? So how do you manage out something like that kind of challenge? Yeah, that's a great point. And, and we tell teams based on your skill set, at least for this particular case, based on your team's skill set, you get to determine who presents, who creates the PowerPoint deck, who does the financial analysis. So if there is a, a significant language barrier, that person does have to speak because they have to practice. That's an important part of it, but it can be a very small component of the overall presentation where the expectation, and obviously this doesn't always happen, but the expectation is they pick up some of the other work okay. throughout the case. So, so you It's not a perfect system. What's yeah. that? So you allow them to decide about who will present and all those things. That's right. Now, we, because we want them to improve, I mean, the, there's three different presentations in this particular course. And obviously the goal is to, to start here and finish here, regardless of where that is for the individual student. So we wanna see that growth and improvement. And especially for the non-native English spe speakers, a big component of that is just building your confidence and getting comfortable being in front of the room. And you have to, you have to practice that. If, if you don't practice that and we don't give them opportunities to improve that, that would be a challenge. Okay. There is another question from Nilesh, sir. Can you share other less intensive classroom examples of action-based learning? Yeah, so you all use, a lot of you use the case methodology, right? how can you take a case that you're already using and take it to the next level? And it doesn't have to be a week long simulation like this. It could be a three minute interview with an, an industry expert talking about how that case applies to them. And that's something that you can recycle. I mean, the shelf life on that can be a few years at least. And that, that will make it more real for the students. So it's not just something that they're reading on paper. I'm currently, I'm, I'm currently in, a, in an online program right now that does a really good job of this. So they'll, they'll provide a very short case and then they'll have a CEO of a company connect it immediately. And that's what makes it stick for me personally. So there's ways to do that. And then I, I think it's important to allow the students to, too many times we think about me as the professor being the authority figure. I have to share my knowledge with the students. We have to allow the students to teach others that peer to peer learning. So just creating that environment can create some action based learning opportunities as well. Okay. Now, uh, Jatendra Singh, another colleague of mine is asking a question, which I also wanted to ask in a little bit a different one. In the age of Googleization and YouTube, how do you keep students engaged in class? Now, I'll, before you answer it, I'll extend it further. When you do, give a case, which is a normal standard one case of let's say Harvard Business School or anything, if I go to YouTube or Google, there is a solution available of that. So how do you assess whether the student doesn't copy paste it directly rather than having the active learning they come up with a solution which is already available. So how do you assess that kind of? I, I hate that students do this and I hate, uh, it's great that 
resources are now available at the tip of our fingers. And the reality is once they, they join the business world or whatever professional area they go into, they're going to have those resources available to them. So why stop them from leveraging what's available? Now you can't plagiarize, don't get me wrong about that, but if, if somebody was working for you, wouldn't you expect them to go out and look at the information that's available to come up with the best solution and sometimes tweak that solution to make it your own? Now, I have moved away. Historically, I've been a big Harvard business case person. I've moved away from those and started writing my own because I, I feel like they're more fit for purpose. I can be more authentic in my teaching. And also the students don't have the solution because I use a new case every single year. So that, that's a high intensity work project if you go that route but that, that's one alternative. But I, I don't think that we should say, students, you can't use X, Y, and Z because we would never do that in industry. A lot of students pursue career opportunities in multinationals, which may require working in developing economies where the challenges can be very different, whether we talk about HR, marketing, or anything. Uh, have you incorporated exercises that focus on problems in such economies? We... We need to do more of that. I, th I think that's a, a gap for sure. We spend a lot of time in this introduction to business class talking about the, the pros and cons of different work environments, whether that be a multinational company, a small mid cap size company, a startup, entrepreneurship. And through that, we also talk about working in, in other countries and the sacrifices that sometimes that takes. What I find in most American students is, and this might be naive, but they're thirsting for those experiences abroad, but they don't really know what they're signing up for. So we try to, to shine light on that, but I'll tell you that is a gap in our curriculum because we're not, we don't, we don't bring enough guest speakers in that can speak to those experiences. And I think we can do more. Okay. Uh, there is uh, one more uh, question from Rajkumar Gupta, sir, which uh, I'll just relate it to what uh, normally in Harvard, if you take up the cases, they invite the person who has been the focal point of the case. At times they do that. So do you also take industry case studies live in the Ohio state or nearby of yours and discuss then the solutions based on what the students are? Because that is that gives the different player to the students and maybe the consulting opportunity also. So do you do that also that you invite those people? Uh, um, live cases? And do you bring the industry people also to discuss the problems in live cases or not? Uh, yes, we do. And we're... We're very lucky in Columbus, Ohio, that we're right next to downtown, and there's a lot of Fortune 500 companies here, So, and a ton of alumni that, that come into town all the time. We're constantly bringing them into the classroom, even as an observer, and that can chime in, that can participate. That's a way, one, to, to keep your alumni engaged in hiring students, but two, bring that industry insight into the classroom. So a lot of our classes, and this is up to the individual faculty members, but a lot of our classes are open door. You can come in and be an observer. Most faculty members wanna know in advance who's coming and why and what they can share, obviously. But I, I encourage it constantly. And I mean, it's a way for us to learn as well, right? So we're learning from the students constantly but bringing somebody into the classroom that's doing it day by day, I have found to be one of the best learning tools for me. I've been out of industry now for, for seven years. I still do some consulting, but we get stale in a lot of ways, right? Now, uh, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, if anybody has, uh, they can unmute themselves and ask. In the meantime, I'll request you one thing. You talked about the rubric which you use. If it is not a confidential or that information, uh, would it be possible for you to kind of share it with the, the audience over here to show that how the rubric is there and how you use that for evaluation, if it is Absolutely. possible? 
Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And this, in full transparency, this is a particular course or particular assignment where we do not provide the students the rubric in advance. This okay. drives them insane. Because okay. if you give a student a detailed rubric, our students are pretty good at checking the boxes, right? It's when, it's when we introduce ambiguity to them that frustration takes place. They want to know, okay, if I do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to get an A or a B. We do not provide the rubric in advance. We do give them the, the high-level criteria that we're going to use. So let me share my screen here. So the, the students don't see this until after the fact. And this is the only assignment in this class that they don't see the rubric in advance. So, but what we do share with them is, the, so I, I mentioned there's pre-work and then there's a meeting with the board of directors and that's how we break down their performance. So within the, the pre-work, we've got strategic thinking and alignment, communication, teamwork and decision-making and responses to inquiries. And under that, we have some kind of proof points of things that we're looking for. They, the students do know that we're looking at these big categories, but they do not see the, the bullets, okay? Not in advance. With the meeting with the board of directors, you're gonna see that the criteria remain the same. The bullets change a little bit and there's a Q&A category. And then I mentioned, I'll probably need to blow this up a little bit, yep. don't I? Then I mentioned a big part of the, the course is communication skills. So we've got this scale that I use, and I'm happy to email this over to you. Personal appearance, movement, elocution, pauses, eye contact, use of information, time management, and then any PowerPoint slides or Prezi that they use. Again, they don't see that in advance. Now, at this point in the semester, they've already given two presentations and they know what we're looking for in giving a presentation. So this part should not come as a, as a total surprise to them. This part, as I mentioned, they've got the high level parts, but again, they're going to be frustrated that you never told me to do that kind of thing. But in a crisis, nobody is telling, if you're the CEO, you might have some people in your ear, but nobody is telling you to do X, Y, and Z. You've got to figure that out for yourself. So I, I don't know if anybody's got any follow-up questions about the rubric or any ideas on, on how to make this better. Definitely, if you share with us, maybe then they would be able to comment. Sure. Yeah. Okay, I've got another question from uh, uh, Shastri, sir, VC, sir. Uh, as someone who spent years in the industry before coming to a career in academia, have a student feedback often indicate a difference between your classes and those of faculty who have had no industry exposure? Are there hidden tensions among the faculty with and without industry exposure? It sounds like you, you all experience the same thing that we experience here <laughs> in a lot of ways. So generally speaking, my, this is my observation, and I know we've got a, a, probably a, a mixed crowd here. Generally speaking, I feel that students gravitate towards faculty members with industry experience. However, that, that is not a prerequisite. People that are able to bring in industry experience, whether that be from themselves, from what they learn, from guest speakers, industry experts, those are the classes that the students appreciate the most. So re regardless of, of your particular experience, how can you incorporate more of that into your class experience? I'll guarantee that your reviews will go up even if it's not coming from you. I mean, as, as someone who worked at, at Shell Oil, that's, that's it for me. I didn't experience multiple companies. Now, I, I do some consulting for multiple companies and I can bring that in, but really my, even my lens being an industry practitioner is very limited. And we all have to recognize based on our experience, what gaps we have and figure out ways to, to fill them. So that's what I would encourage 
everyone to do. That's what I try to do. Okay. Now coming to the second part, which you've not touched upon right now, has this to how does the student respond to somebody coming from industry and not coming from industry? Do, do you feel that the student's response to them has been, uh, is different or it is the same? I think the student response is generally the same. There, there, there's no doubt that there is a, a distinction of faculty members, your tenure track, full professors versus people like me who are a senior lecturer. I'm, 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 I'm towards the bottom of the totem pole. And I've reconciled that now. I've been at Fisher since 2016. And really the reward for me in the, in the work is the relationship with the students. And, uh, you, you know, you're always going to have some faculty members that do amazing research and that's what they want to do. That's what they're good at. And I support them as, as best I can. And hopefully they'll support me as best I can. I'm kind of taking the political answer there. <laughs> okay, uh, I've got one question from Sandeep, sir. Uh, how you find, uh, you definitely would be having in your entire class, some students coming from India, some coming from China and American students. So we have a different perspective for Indian students in our universities. How do you find uh, Indian students and American students? What is your uh, take on the comparative environment? How do Indian students... Uh, maybe perform in comparison to the native students over there? Yeah, so generally speaking, I would say that the Indian students are superior to the American students at, at an aggregate level. Now, obviously you've got your, your anomalies, but I, I would say that for, for several different reasons. One, there's just more skin in the game for them. They've come across the world they're paying a, a significantly more amount for tuition. And the challenge for them on the back end to get a job, if they wanna stay in the United States, which most people do at least for a few years, it's, it's so much more difficult, at least here in the United States for them to secure a job because it requires sponsorship. So they know, they know coming in that they have to work a little bit harder. And that gives them, quite frankly, a competitive advantage because that motivation and effort is already there. Whereas with some American students, they may already have their established network. They may already know where they're going after graduation. So they're somewhat on cruise control. Now I see the question in terms of the competencies that are yeah, desired from sense. employers, yeah. especially multinationals. We have definitely, and I'm sure you're experiencing that this over, over there as well, we have definitely seen a shift in the competencies that are being sought out for new hires coming out of the business environment. A big, so, so technology is key in being able to, to leverage resources, whether that be software as a service, data analytics is absolutely critical, but being able to visualize that data and do storytelling. So with, with all of the hard skills, I always tell students, you've got to be able to pair it with the soft skills, because even if you've got that technical expertise, if you can't go to management and sell it and tell a story to inform decisions, you're not going to be that effective. And so many of the, the multinational companies that, that are based here in the U.S. that do hire international students, they're using the case method for their interviews. And a lot of times they've, they've moved from doing a case in real time in the interview to giving that, that prospective candidate the case a few days in advance where they have time to prep and they actually come to the interview with a proposed solution. No, and but, uh, th that definitely will pair the technical versus the soft skills. The diversity that, that you all have at your university, at least for the classes that are more team oriented, do you allow the students to select teams or do you tailor that to kind of put that diversity, make sure that diversity is represented in the teams? Um, I, I can take my example, I, maybe others can join in to give it. 
I normally uh, take up the background of the students. So let's say if I talk about a PG class, if I talk about financial management PG, I take up the, the background, let's say BCom, BA, BTech, and I make sure that not all BCom are together, not all BTech are together. So I try, try to create first the diverse group, like you said, female, male, uh, male both uh, proportions are there, different uh, academic backgrounds come into that so that yeah. uh, you get different perspectives. Otherwise, if you put all the BCom together, they would have a different approach. A BTech may look at the case study in a different way. So that is the uh, process I follow. I open the forum. Anybody else wants to comment on this, please? There's, there's another question in the chat. Yeah, I'll, I'll take up the question. I'll take up the question from Sandeep Ji. Uh, how you justify the success of business school dropouts like Bill Gates and few others compared to those who complete their course? What makes it happen? Yeah. <laughs> So we're always going to have those anomalies, right? I, I'm a huge believer in higher ed, probably because what it did for me. When I finished high school, I had been to this town on the East Coast in Southeastern Ohio. That's all I knew. I, I was very narrow in, for me, coming to Ohio State, it just opened my eyes to a world of opportunity. Meeting people from all around the world, learning from leaders all around the world, industries, companies, you name it. I needed, and I think so, the vast majority of the population needs that time to grow up and to learn. And I, I mean, how many, how many Bill Gates are there in the world? I mean, there's just not that many. We're always going to see those anomalies, but what our challenge is in higher ed is with the masses, how can we train them for a world that five years from now, nobody can predict? And we've got to think about the transferable skills that regardless of what that world looks like, we know these skills are going to be applicable. Uh, please, anyone, any other question you have, please feel free to ask. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. So as we're, as we're wrapping up, one thing that's on my mind, and I brought this up to Neelish a couple times, is I want to figure out what a, a partnership between Ohio State and your university looks like. I take a group of students a group of 30 students internationally every year. And perhaps this could be a stop for us. We also are open to, we, we've done, we've worked it with a university in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where we do a, a live case. So a, a company sponsored case, and we put American students and Brazilian students on the same team. They work virtually over the semester but then we travel or they could come to us and the students get to meet in person and they make that proposal or recommendation to the company. That's another peak moment that I would love to create with, with, with you all. Yeah, definitely. We'll look forward to maybe writing jointly cases together in future. Yes. Uh, uh, Tyler, I think uh, that opens up a world of opportunities. Uh, if I look at my own experience in the past on this, uh, I've had the chance to host at, uh, not when in Jagran now, but in my earlier institution, we had a chance to host for several years, uh, students from the State University of New York, Stony Brook, who used to come every year for a month. They used to spend one month in India, one month in China, and I think one month in Vietnam. And these students used to do courses on Asia. And in each of these three countries, they took three courses each for a month and completed those courses in a month uh, through lectures, through discussions. The weekends were spent in cultural interactions with uh, Indian families attending a marriage, uh, spending a weekend with an Indian family home. So. Uh, it was an exciting course and yeah. it was extremely successful uh, at the university level. 
this also led to an exchange where students from our side went there and did a course similarly. We graduated to making it. Students from both the universities sat together in those courses and studied those courses together. I think, so I think there is a, uh, the, the, I think the, the scope for such collaboration is uh, tremendous. And I would encourage um, uh, Dr. Nilesh to carry forward this discussion with you. And I am there to support whatever can be done. And we have a wonderful campus at Bhopal. And once this uh, pandemic ends, we have a wonderful residential campus. So we can house people. We can do things. So I think there is tremendous scope for yeah. Yeah, collaboration to happen. Okay, uh, I just have one question, Tyler, just to kind of maybe uh, some of us are not asking. Looking at you, I can definitely feel that you're a lot younger than uh, what it appears to be right now. And what Nilesh sir was telling me earlier that you shifted to academics at a very young age. So for the younger faculty, I want to ask this question. How do you, do you maintain that gap between the student and the faculty at a young age when you start your career in academics? Yeah. So how do you manage correct. that out, please? I, I've learned the hard way too, because okay. it is it is an advantage being able to relate a little bit better to to the students just because of that proximity and age. But and I always tell my grad assistants this: it's a lot easier to loosen up as the semester goes, as as opposed to getting more strict. So you do have to main maintain that authority figure from from day one. Because you all know, if you give the students a little bit of rope, they're going to take it and then some. So that's almost learning by doing. We, we do not have a program like this at Ohio State. We absolutely should. I was looking at your list of speakers. I am so jealous of the experience that all of you have been able to partake in over the last several days. And I, I actually shared it with our associate dean. I said, we've got to do something like this because there's a hunger for it and as i mentioned earlier if there's just one nugget you can take from each session think about the the skill set of all of your faculty at the university and how that will grow it's it's huge so it it's it's an advantage being a little bit closer in age but you do have to maintain your your distance and authority Okay, so that's what I thought. Tyler, if I could just come in here at this stage with a question. Uh, in your, in the American university system, this tradition of uh, focusing on research and foc and research being a priority, and a lot of other teachers after a particular stage in their career saying, no, I would like to devote more time to teaching. I would prefer to devote more time to the classroom. Uh, how have you looked at this uh, uh, more teaching, more research? Uh, do you think that those baskets should be there or should you really, uh, uh, should we really break those boundaries? How would you look? Because this is a debate that's going on in India too today. Yeah, don't, don't share this with my fellow faculty members here at Fisher, but, and this is a long conversation about the whole tenure system and just how the incentives are, at least here in the United States. So as a professor, you're compensated based on your research and your, your publication output. Teaching is, is secondary. And if those incentives do not change, people are going to focus on, on where the, the money is. Now, as a senior lecturer, I am not responsible. I don't have a, a research output in, in my goals. So that makes it easy for me to just focus on the teaching. But how can we create a system where our tenure track folks that are doing the research are also rewarded for their teaching? Because if, if they're bringing that research into the classroom, everybody wins. But until that incentive system gets realigned, I don't think we're going to see that. And I'll, I'll tell you one thing, in the U.S., the power structure, the, the people that are making these decisions have tenure. So why disrupt that apple cart? The going, the going is good. Now, technology is disrupting higher ed. I mean, we see it. 
and players like Google or Amazon or many others, the dinosaurs like Ohio State are going to have to adapt, but it's a question of how quickly we're going to have to adapt. It's going to look very different 10 years from now. I just don't know how different. <laughs> Uh, I'll ask in the same uh, the question which Sarsi sir asked. I'll just ask: uh, Is research in like in Ohio State and other business schools in US is research limited to research papers, or because you said how to bring that to the classroom? That is what I found that most of the Harvard professors have a long list of cases which they use. So, is it limited to research papers, or it is encouraging to write case studies and all those also? It is. It is a little bit of both. The 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 research papers are prioritized. However, we've just started in the last two years, we've got this thing called Fisher Lead Read Today. And it's taking a lot of the research that our, our professors are doing and putting it in like a one page, almost executive memo for the masses to consume. Because I mean, how, how many industry practitioners are going to read a, a 20 page or even longer research paper? Very few, but we're, we're challenging our professors to dumb it down, make it more applicable to industry pr pr practitioners. And Lead Read Today is a publication that gets sent out daily that highlights some of those different articles in a consumable way. Okay, Alesha, please, you wanted to say something. So, so I think this, this debate is very interesting. So I thought that I would just chime in. I also had an opportunity to talk to uh, Rishikesh Krishnan, who is now the director for I Am Bangalore on this issue when I moved in. So uh, uh, Ty, uh, I mean, you would know uh, so my respect for research and management. Uh, so, so, so what is uh, what I learned uh, in this in this in this case is the management uh, research. The way it happens in the top journals is not that applicable like the science or engineering is. So that actually creates a problem for bringing your research in classroom in a way that it could actually be applicable. Now, the, some of the very senior professors in India actually said that the real challenge in India is that our institutes are not measuring up international ranking. So our, uh, the reason why we are joining the bandwagon is actually because we really want to see our, uh, our, our, our ranking up there. Now, the only people who could actually stay away from pure academic research and still have a good ranking is like Harvard, but it's less likely that any institute in India would get there. So I, I think what happened, I was talking to Anil Makhija, who's the Dean at Fisher College of Business. He actually said this, that uh, the whole idea of clinical professors, like the, you have Jay Dial or you have other clinical professors who have come in, and that's the way. So the senior lectureship is just completely teaching track and then the clinical professorship, which is actually aligned people who were earlier in tenure track, but then have you know, developed hard for teaching, want to come in. And then of course, you ten tenure track remains a tenure track. So I think there's some combination that they're trying to strike and nobody has the uh, you know, answer for the, 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 the balance that yeah. we'd like to have here. Yeah, the mix is a good, is a good question. We are seeing, our institution is seeing more hires come from industry. So the senior lecturer type. So the percentage of that is going up, but still the majority, the vast majority are tenure track. Uh, I think I've got the last question to ask uh, from Devanshu, sir, he's asking, uh, what would be your take uh, or a piece of advice on leadership skills? It would be great if we can have a take on your, uh, ex from, uh, your experience, we can get some idea. Yeah. That's a great question. So we, the, there's a professor named Tim Judge. He's one of the, the he, I think he's the second most cited IO psychologist in the world. He came from Notre Dame and he's now here at the Fisher College of Business. And he has created, he and his team have created what we call the build leadership model and similar to, to a lot of leadership evaluations that, that some of you have taken, that's that 360 degree. So you're asking your boss, your subordinates, and your peers for feedback. How am I doing? When I think of leadership today, 
humility is absolutely key and being willing to recognize our gaps and figure out ways to bridge those gaps unapologetically. The expectation, I, I think the media has an unrealistic expectation for leaders today or even governmental leaders today that we should know everything, right? It's just not possible. So the amazing leaders that we see are the ones that bridge those gaps by surrounding them with the right people. So I've, I've set a, a goal. I go through a 360 degree evaluation every single year. And I've done that for, I think this will be the fourth year that I've done that. And every year there's a new gap that, that, that comes about that I can work on. And I share it with my mentors, which is another key component of, of leadership. You're never too old or too seasoned or too much of an expert to have mentors. And we should all have a couple of those people in our lives that we can pick up the phone at any point and ask for, for advice. So I would say that's another important thing is, is growing faculty members and leaders at, at your university. That's important. 